let's talk to our next guest. He's Credit Suisse's vice chairman of fixed income for the Asia PAC. And we're talking to Bunt Ghosh on the program today. Welcome, yeah. uh, Bunt. So what do you think of PIMCO's assessment? Does that make I sense? Think I think it's a very sensible assessment. I think you have governments with relatively little debt compared to debt in, the Europe, in Europe and the United States. I think you have corporate sectors that are by and large less leveraged as well. Growth is there. I think it's by far the most sensible thing I, you could do. Yeah, some pretty them. spectacular yield rates across the Asia Pac. You look at Indonesia, you look That's at right. other developing markets. And it's really transforming. I mean, if you look at Indonesia, well, the yields are spectacular. The economy itself is actually doing incredibly well. Uh, the government's putting together a lot of reform packages. It's become a major exporter of energy again. Um, I think the things are all going the right way. Yeah. You couldn't ask for anything better. Uh, I think the only possible risk in the short term in the horizon is maybe some inflation risk, but even that I think is quite minimal. Hey, Ban, if someone walked up to you on the street and said, what's the best bet right now in the fixed income space in the Asia pack, how, do you, how would you respond to that question? I would say the best bet here is, is to buy corporate debt uh, in, in Asia pack. I think government debt is relatively still, uh, the government debt markets are still underdeveloped compared to what, uh, Europe and the United States. I think, uh, also I think the uh, government debt in Asia tends to be a, a lot diff more difficult to access, mm. particularly bonds. Um, and uh, the corporate market is easier, that's where you're going to get pick up the growth as well. Are there any sectors that might perform better than others in the Asia back in terms of corporate debt, corporate bonds? I, th I think we're certainly fairly uh, bullish on bank capital. Bank capital is one of the trades, which is a trade that a lot of people have on, particularly in Europe uh, and the United States, but I think it's a relatively underpopulated trade in Asia. Um, I think uh, the manufacturing is still a fairly good trade, especially if the recovery takes place. We think, for instance, exports in Asia will start recovering quite sharply. They've begun to recover. As you get more and decent growth in the United States, mm -hmm. that uh, exporters should continue to do well. Yeah, what about currencies across the Asia pack? It seems the consensus is the Korean won, the Indonesian rupiah, and the Indian rupee. That seems to be what I consistently hear, but how do you see things in the currency markets? I think there'll be a tendency for all, for all these currencies to want to appreciate. That's the bet everybody's putting on, that eventually you know, all the Asian currencies will have to reflect those current account surpluses. Mm -hmm. I think governments will still fight, fight that trade. What makes them fight that trade less is if inflation pro prospects start picking up. Then I think there will be an urge to maybe we should let the currencies rise a bit to try and take some of the pressure on domestic inflation related currencies. And I think that's the bet everybody's playing. And now, is that the bet in China? Because we've been talking about Chinese <laughs> appreciation, of course. I think, uh, you know, I, I, I'm sure uh, the Chinese have their own view. Mm -hmm. But I do think eventually it is, it, it is, the, it is the outcome that uh, will, will perhaps force the hand. Mm -hmm. I think uh, domestic inflation is a big, uh, is a big issue. I think uh, food price particularly, which is uh, all domestic. Mm -hmm. uh, energy. Now, let, yeah, let me ask you about the, what is the hot topic uh, here at the Credit Suisse conference in terms of the uh, fixed income space? What do people keep wanting to talk to you about? Greece. Greece. Tell me about Greece. Greece. Yeah. <laughs> Greece is greasy. Um. Now, <laughs> <laughs> now uh, Professor Martin Feldstein says Greece is pretty much dead. Do you agree with that? Um, you can reduce, you know, 12 percent uh, deficit. It's very difficult to see how they get out, and I think the EU is making the mistake of trying to uh, talk the talk but not walk the walk. They're trying to hope they can keep Greece. Uh, going mm -hmm. without actually committing any capital because it's politically so difficult for them to commit capital. I think that's going to be very difficult. Mm -hmm. So for me, if you kind of look at the experience of other countries that have had these kind of problems, Argentina, Turkey, Mexico, these inevitably go through three or four rounds. You get some relief because statements are made, some money is provided. Uh, some recovery, some reform takes place. Six months down the road, oh guys, we haven't done enough. Let's mm -hmm. have another bout of it. So you're going to go through three or four rounds of this. Okay. And each one, I think, will be a fake. And the question really becomes, by the end of the year, have the Greeks really done enough to do it? And the scale of what the Greeks have to do 
because they can't devalue the currency, is just enormous. Yeah. It's just you know, it's difficult to see how. What about the euro then? Do you see it staying intact? Some are saying it's difficult to see it being what it is—a common currency for all those nations involved. That's that's a more difficult question because you're going to see some recovery in Europe from at least ge European exports. Germany should recover with the weaker euro, so the core of Europe will continue to do well, I think, mm -hmm. or will start recovering. Uh, so, what should people do with their euro holdings? Hold My personal it. bias would be that the euro is likely to suffer a bit further before we see. And particularly if the Greek crisis get, gets worse, I think the euro will have to suffer. Yeah, I've heard of uh, some, t you know, some uh, distress levels of the euro, 115, 120. Do you think it'll get to those levels? It may spike down, but I don't think it'll stay there. Okay. I don't think it'll stay there. Now, now Professor Martin Feldstein uh, also in, in basically rolls Portugal into uh, the Greece <laughs> crisis as well. Do you see Portugal heading down that road? I think Portugal is trying to do better. Yeah. I think one of the concerns with Greece has been that the Greeks had fiddled so many numbers that no one trusted anything anymore. Mm -hmm. The other big issue with Greece is tax collections are so poor. Mm. That is not the case in both Portugal and Spain, which are kind of part of that uh, sort of nexus. Okay. And the other example that people haven't actually mentioned is what Ireland has done. Ireland had a problem not dissimilar in terms of the crisis. It had the fixed exchange rate, of course, the euro. Ireland have done an enormous amount. If you look at I recovery in CDS spreads, yeah. has been enormous. So okay. it can be done and both Portugal and Spain are capable of doing it. Okay. I think Greece is much more difficult. Okay, Bun, thanks for joining us today. My Bun pleasure. Gosh, Vice Chairman of Fixed Income here in the Asia Fab.